So then we go, so now, so we've agreed kind of full fashion, and I agree. I mean, I think that it's 500, we don't even know, you know, whether it's oral, and now we're in the Paloma, you know, now we're in the Paloma, you know, we're in the, the Palpacicla, the CDK4 era, the CDK4-6 era, where we're not using single agent aromatase inhibitors right. anyway. So, but now the question is, so now we're using fulvestrin, right? Do we combine it with things? That's the next thing. So now we get to um, Hope Paloma 3, which is combining palbociclib with So you know, the, the whole world of hormone receptor positive <coughs> disease now in the metastatic setting is about targeted therapy and how we can improve response. Uh, and you know, we talk about reverse resistance, but really what we're trying to do is improve response to endocrine therapy and improve the duration of response. I think those are our two biggest goals. And the CDK data is really fascinating because it came from UCLA and, uh, you know, Dennis Slayman being his uh, usual sort of looking ahead to the next step and where things can come from. They have a, a cell line, uh, a series of cell lines at UCLA, and they were able to expand this further and show that where CDK inhibitors were most likely to have a benefit was in uh, ER positive like disease and HER2 positive which disease, is totally which is another area. Right. That was completely yeah, counter to it. was. And, you know, the, I remember uh, somebody telling me from one of the companies that has a CDK inhibitor, well, it's only in luminal bees, but we don't know that. There's absolutely no data that shows it. But uh, so there will be data way. coming out of these trials, I think, that tells right. us more about it. But I think that, you know, the idea is HER2, whereas, for example, in the triple negative or mesenchymal like cell lines, there was no activity at all. So that was as, you know, I think very intriguing data and led for phase one and then the phase two trial Paloma one, which of course uh, is I think somewhat surprisingly for many of us led to accelerated approval in the first line setting in combination with letrozole. So at the same time that that was, uh, by the time the approval was given, the phase three trial had already completed accrual, which I think is one of the sort of requirements of the FDA. So Paloma 2 is this Me Too-like trial. So letrozole, uh, you didn't relapse within a year on an AI, uh, but you know you could have received hormone therapy before. Letrozole placebo versus letrozole palbociclib. And these trials are really interesting because they're all weighted towards the novel agent. So we're gonna have a lot of data with the novel agent. It means they do a little bigger trial or they expect a huge benefit, which is a downside in analyzing results uh, statistically. But that was a three to one trial. So then Paloma 3, of course, the next step is, well, what happens in those people who relapsed on an AI and are gonna go on fulvestrant? So the Paloma 3 was palbociclib and fulvestrant versus fulvestrant and placebo, a two to one randomization. What's fascinating about this trial is it started long after Paloma 2, but it reported at least a year in advance. We expect about a year in advance, right? Uh, and that's because, of course, the time to progression is so much shorter in the second line setting. But Paloma 3 showed a doubling of uh, time to progression or progression free survival when you added palbociclib to fulvestrant. And interestingly, although a third of the patients had received one line of prior chemo, there was no real difference in toxicity. And in fact, comparing it to Paloma 1, much less patients uh, stopped drug due to toxicity. We all got kind of used to the neutropenia and managing the drug. So it's actually, I think, a fascinating data set. No survival data yet. Uh, but did I they have present to say, the survival data? I thought that they, there's not enough events. I mean, nobody's dead yet. That, I mean, thankfully, there's like a what did they present at San Antonio then? What, the, uh, the, subset analysis. Subset analysis. The subset analysis. analysis. I thought they presented the survival. They didn't present mm, just survival. updated okay. analyses. So, okay. but the interesting thing, uh, <coughs> I think, uh, also is that if you think about it, people said, well, you know, palbociclib in the first line setting, you don't have to give it. There's no survival advantage yet. But you know, <laughs> you know, go back. We we all use AIs, right? first line in a patient who's not on hormone therapy. And that's based on trials, none of which that showed a survival advantage. So I think that the issue is it's very hard for us to power these trials for survival advantages, and it's gonna be hard to know. Now, you know, so we're gonna see results from uh, Paloma 2 sometime in 2016. We're gonna see results from uh, the uh, two other very interesting studies. So there's the Mona Lisa trial with ribociclib, Novartis' CDK4-6 inhibitor, and then there's a third CDK4-6 inhibitor, which is quite a little bit different from the others, a bemociclib uh, from Lilly, and that drug had single agent activity, which the other two don't seem to have much of. Uh, and really a fairly impressive single agent activity in phase one. So they did a single agent phase two trial, a monarch trial, and uh, that trial will also be presented uh, either at ACR or ASCO is my guess. I mean, all this is event driven, but that's single agent drug in refractory hormone receptor positive disease. And then of course they also have their full Was that study. a phase two or phase three? Phase, phase two. two. And, phase and two. continuous dosing, which is also yeah. right. interesting because mm -hmm. of the relative you don't have to stop. lack of 
cytopenia is seen right. with the abemocyclid, but more of the liver and GI. You yeah. get a lot of diarrhea. Everybody takes abemocyclid gets diarrhea, uh, but it's not neuretinib diarrhea. And uh, so you don't have to take upfront prophylaxis, but you have to be taking Imodium. So, you know, my patients who are on Abamaciclib for a long time traveled with their Imodium. So. Right. One of the things they loved about Paloma 3 was that they allowed premenopausal women to be enrolled, 15, 18% or so, and right. showed benefit in the forest plot. But and you had to, which really you're pretty much you had to have an You did, right. I think, was such a silly <clears throat> thing that the studies have said, you know, you had to be postmenopausal either by age or have your ovaries out, that you couldn't get an injection. And yeah. that, this trial, I think, really made a big difference in it's changing right. that. That'll change, I think, the way we do trials. Although you in the have future. to be aware that, you know, 20% or so of patients will have ovarian function breakthrough. So while I don't care so much about that on fulvestrin, with the aromatase inhibitors, it may be to their detriment. It may. So especially in the curative setting, where a lot of us, not to get back to the early breast cancer setting, but I think it's an important point to make clearly that periodically monitoring estradiol level is probably important when we're you know, using an AI. It's interesting that you say that because uh, we're finishing up the ASCO guidelines for hormone therapy for metastatic hormone receptor positive breast measure. cancer. Are you going to put it in? The, well, I've put it in. It's been taken out uh, three times. That's so, why you're giggling uh, in the corner. Uh, right, good. <laughs> well, now say put it back in. I'm ASCO, it back in. ASCO, we're saying put it back in. All right? And I have to be very <laughs> diffuse about the comment because in truth, all of the people who are involved in these guidelines have said there is no data to support uh, that. Soft and study. There's, 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 there's no data to support that. No, there is no data there. to say that you're going to do worse if your estradiol is 20 oh, or 30 or 40 or 60. We just don't know. We just believe but it. But there are data that <laughs> so, suggests that, it, like as, no, as are, Sarah said, you know, 15, 20 percent of women will not have suppressed estradiol. But the question is, do they do worse, and do you have to monitor? And I monitor, and I feel strongly about it also. Right. But we don't know actually. Are we ever going to know that? Mm -hmm. No. That's the problem. Well, the other thing is that people get very casual about starting to go with the every three months, yep. or every four months. Right, that's a whole other issue. That's another big issue and as well. And it just frightens me to watch that happen, thinking that they're getting any suppression, that there's yeah. no escape that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to make the point about the uh, Paloma 3 from San Antonio, the subset analyses looking at the, ful the fulvestrin with the um, pelvocyclic. Again, I was surprised because I looked at, you know, uh, no prior endocrine therapy except relapsing in the, in the adjuvant, one prior endocrine, and then even two prior endocrines. Mm. Very nice delta with the, um, yeah. uh, with the palpocyclib. It was like 1.8 months with fulvestrin alone, which is obviously poor, and way up there, you know, a much, much higher, like in the nine-month range with the fulvestrin and palpocyclib. So even in patients who had several lines of therapy, there was still nice, mm -hmm. nice benefit there. So that was, that was helpful to see. Yeah, yeah they're small subsets in yeah. that group, but I, I also agree. I thought that was nice to mm -hmm. show. But so, this is a beauty of riches now and the sequencing of these Well, here therapies. we go. So <laughs> but let's talk, I mean, because that's the first thing. So we all think this is great, Paloma 3, but now we have Paparlacin. We have the Bell trial, the Bell 3 that first got it, Bell 2 actually. Uh, Joyce, can you comment on Bell 2 and let us know about it? <laughs> yes. So uh, that was also a fulvestrin backbone. It was in patients who have progressed on a non steroidal AI. Fulvestrin placebo versus the pan PI3 kinase inhibitor buparlacin oral agent with fulvestrin. It was technically a positive trial. It met its primary endpoint of progression free survival with about a two month improvement. However, the um, consensus is that it really wasn't clinically meaningful because the toxicity of buparlacin had quite a lot, some liver toxicity, hyperglycemia, mood disorders, et cetera. So it really wasn't clinically meaningful. They looked at um, the paraffin blocks, which of course were mostly primary archival going back some years for PI3 kinase pa pathway activation, PIK3C mutations, P10 loss, not useful in terms of predicting, even though it was stratified based on that, not useful got a baseline blood draw, you know, for circulating tumor DNA. Look for that PIK3CA mutation, so not the P10 story, but just the PIK3CA. Very helpful in terms of delineating patients. Big benefit from the buparlacin. Quite interesting, very helpful to see. I think we might have a new way to enrich these patients. Which I think very is great. Exciting, that to me you know? is the first real yes. proof. Yeah. That to me is the biggest thing out of the whole Yeah, that, right. was that it was a the, real proof of concept of exactly. the circulating that's DNA. Right. Concept. But what about the numbers? Right. I mean, oh, it's so to small. Me, it, was it was such <laughs> a tiny subset. I, I thought that it's hypothesis generated, yeah, it but it can't change what we do because you have to have a study where, you know, 85% of your patients have data, not 10% yes. or whatever, whatever it was, 15 or 20%, yeah. I, not even. And the numbers weren't balanced between the two arms well. So it's fascinating, but you can't 
run forward with it, but maybe what you can do is incorporate it into other mm -hmm. trials. Right, yeah. I think it that- It can't save this agent, I mean, probably. we'll all agree yeah, yeah, that yeah, Bartle Sib as an agent with Fulvestrin probably is not gonna be no, taken to the No, not gonna be going level. forward. Uh, you know, you know the, the, the PAN PI3 kinase inhibitors, I mean, they have to be more targeted, alpha-specific, mm -hmm, whatever. I think mm -hmm. that's where people are it going. It seems that that's the way things are evolving, yes. yes. But I'm not sure even those. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of concerned oh, about a, the toxicity. I love the alpha-specific. Do you really? Now, I haven't used Tocilisib, which uh, I understand has some differential toxicities like colitis, which I haven't seen with Alpelisib. But Alpelisib is was BYL, right. and uh, that's an alpha-specific PI3 kinase inhibitor. Uh, and we, I have a patient on it who got who she had Everolimus for 18 months, and it was good. Developed liver metastases. Waited to get on this phase one trial of Fulvestrin and Alpelisib. You know, where we're all biting our fingernails. And she went on it uh, two and a half years ago, and she's had she has no liver meths left, mm -hmm. right? Wow. So she's had essentially she a, a visceral CR. Circulating DNA mutation. Well, so they they sent out something with some updates saying that you know no patients, the only patients who responded had PI three kinase mutations. And I emailed back and said, well, what about my patient? They said, well, she had archival tumor tissue. The bottom line is that we kept biopsying her liver. We couldn't get enough tumor tissue, so we used her old tumor, and that tumor did not have a PI3 kinase What about her blood? Did you do a blood test? We could at some point. She's still responding, so at okay. some point we could look, yeah. and uh, that would be useful information. But she's not the only one. I have uh, two patients who are on that phase one trial who are still on it uh, two plus years. So I think that, and that it seems to be, other than this long-term hyperglycemia, so you know, you can, even if you don't get hyperglycemia early, you can get it late. Uh, but if you don't get a rash right away, you don't get a rash, and rash seems to have nothing to do with the response. So, what I like about the the CT DNA that we're seeing more and more studies are incorporating is it helps overcome this temporal and spatial heterogeneity of right. tumors. Very this much problem so. with with the differences between archive samples and great what's comment. going on yes. now. Mm -hmm. Well, no, and the fact that in this trial a predicted response, all the criticisms of circulating DNA. Well, maybe it's only a subset of cells that shed tumor, you know, a subset of METs that shed the tumor mm -hmm, into the blood. Right. I think that if you can actually use it, if it's useful as a predictive marker now, you know, for response, I think that's really cool. And, mm -hmm. and future <coughs> trials in the metastatic setting should not be allowing archival tumor tissue to, to, to enter into going the trial. Forward. It needs I think to that's gonna, dis completely disappear. It's yeah. going to be a MET biopsy or circulating DNA, I'm guessing. Right, because then you can't biopsy bone, so it's a big issue. Right.